Darren Wilson, who shot and killed the unarmed 18-year-old Michael Brown, resigned from the Ferguson Police Department on Saturday. He will not receive any severance package or benefits, according to the mayor of Ferguson. In his resignation letter, Darren Wilson said, it was my hope to continue in police work, but the safety of other police officers in the community is of paramount importance to me. It is my hope that my resignation will allow the community to heal. But if resignations can help a community to heal, Ferguson will need more than just Darren Wilson's. Kathy Aliza Day, the assistant district attorney who led the grand jury's investigation, clearly sided with Officer Wilson. The New York Times analysis of the grand jury transcripts reports, quote, the prosecutors rare, rarely asked skeptical questions of Officer Wilson and frequently let testimony supporting him pass unchallenged while boring in on the statements of witnesses whose accounts conflicted with the officers. The most positive possible assessment of Kathy Eliza Day's work with the grand jury was that she was utterly and completely incompetent. The only other possibility is that she was actively biased in Darren Wilson's favor and acted in an unprofessional and unethical manner on her bias. As I pointed out on this program last week, in a stunning burst of incompetence or deliberate misdirection, Kathy Eliza Day actually handed the grand jury a copy of what she said was the law governing police use of deadly force. But it had not actually been the law since 1985 when the United States Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. Kathy Eliza Day handed the grand jury a copy of an old unconstitutional law that had not been the law during her entire legal career. It was a law very favorable to Darren Wilson because it said that police in Missouri had the right to shoot any fleeing suspect simply because the suspect is fleeing. The Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional in 1985, but Kathy Eliza Day did not tell the grand jury that. Instead, she let the grand jury sit through virtually all of the witness testimony, believing the old law was still in force. And only at the very end of the grand jury's process, just before they were ready to deliberate, did Kathy Eliza Day hand them a new document specifying the correct law on police use of deadly force. And she told them, as she handed them that law, that does correctly state what the law is on when an officer can use force and when he can use deadly force in effecting an arrest, okay? I don't want you to get confused and don't rely on that copy or that printout of the statute that I've given you a long time ago. It is not entirely incorrect or inaccurate, but there is something in it that's not correct. Ignore it totally. A grand juror then asked her, the Supreme Court, federal court, overrides Missouri statutes? Now, we all learned the answer to that in high school. It is one word, yes. But she could not bring herself to give that answer, that simple one word answer. Instead, Kathy Eliza Day, who took an oath as a lawyer to guide that grand jury in the most helpful, honest, and ethical way possible, actually refused to answer that simple question from a grand juror. Does the Supreme Court override the Missouri statute? And instead, Kathy Eliza Day told the grand jury, quote, just don't worry about that. The other assistant district attorney in the room with her chimed in, we don't want to get into a law class. The grand juror's question didn't require a law, law class. It required a one-word answer, yes, an answer that Kathy Eliza Day refused to give. Kathy Eliza Day also never explained to the grand jury what was incorrect about that unconstitutional old law that she had given them, and she never explained to the grand jury the specifics of the new law that she handed to them on a piece of paper at the end of their investigation. Kathy Eliza Day's name does not appear in most reports and analysis of the Michael Brown case, but no one had a stronger influence on the grand jury's decision than Kathy Eliza Day. We have invited the district attorney, Robert McCullough, and assistant district attorney, Kathy Eliza Day, to join us on this program at any time convenient to them, and we have submitted the following questions to the district attorney. 
How many times has Kathy Eliza Day submitted the wrong law to a grand jury as its legal framework for an investigation? How many times has the district attorney's office as a group submitted the wrong law to a grand jury as the legal framework for that grand jury's investigation? And is the Michael Brown case the very first time that the district attorney's office submitted the wrong law to a grand jury as the legal framework for that grand jury's investigation? We have received no answers to any of those questions. Joining me now is Kendall Coffey, a former federal prosecutor, and John Burris, a criminal defense attorney who represented Rodney King against the Los Angeles Police Department and the family of Oscar Grant against the Bay Area Rapid Transit Police. Uh, John Burris, I want to go to you because uh, we're now at the stage where the question is, what's next? Uh, there's two possible questions here. One is, uh, the federal investigation and a possible federal prosecution, and then secondly, what civil remedies does the family have in bringing a lawsuit? Well, two things. Uh, certainly, in terms of a federal prosecution, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office or the Department of Justice can, in fact, bring a lawsuit, a criminal uh, lawsuit against uh, the officer on the U.S. 18 U.S.C. 242, and race is not required. It, it's just really the use of excessive force under the color of law, they call it privilege and immunity, that can be done. That's not that challenging of a case. It's not any different than bringing a murder case against a police officer. So that actually can be done, although people think that it can't be. I don't think that. I think it's easily, it can be prosecuted. There's plenty of evidence to show to support it, particularly when Mr. When officer says that he contemplated his legal right to take this shot in, in the last two shots. That certainly suggests to me that it was a reckless disregard. He intended to kill him. He intended to violate his civil rights at the time. Now, of course, they can bring a federal civil rights case under 42 U.S.C. 1983. These are common cases. They're brought all the time. I have brought many, I have brought many of these types of cases. And, and it, again, it's the question of whether excessive force was used. In this particular case, the standard and burden of proof under a civil rights case on, is, is less. It's, bird, it's a preponderance of evidence. Whereas in a criminal case, it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a much higher standard. But it's not any different than the standard you have in a regular criminal case. And so uh, I think that either one of those can be brought. Both of, I know the civil case has to be brought. That's easy enough to do. That's a private matter. can be done by private lawyers. On the other hand, uh, the, the criminal case has to be brought by the U.S. Attorney's Office or it can be brought out of the D Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. That also can be done. We certainly had that in the Rodney King case. Here, I think that the the concern is that the state uh, prosecutors have messed up the case by their examination of the various witnesses and therefore making it very difficult to bring another case. But at the same time, if you listen to the officer's statements, those statements in and of themselves seems to me constitute the basis upon which a, a civil rights case can be brought and won, because it's his statements to shoot a man who was, uh, who had been wounded two or three times, who was walking woundedly. He claimed that he had some supernatural strength, and he took the necessary effort to shoot this man twice, this young man, both in the, in the face and in the head, and he did that when he was 30, 30 or more feet away. That's murder. Kendall Coffey, uh, your reaction to what we're learning about how this grand jury worked, and, and specifically uh, what I just outlined and I went through last week about Kathy Lisa Day submitting the wrong law uh, as the framework for this investigation before Officer Wilson testifies, and then at the very last minute, the very one of the last things she does before that grand jury goes off to deliberate among themselves is the, she hands them the right law. But in both instances, she just hands it to them on a piece of paper. She doesn't even explain the law to them. Well, and there's no excuse for misstating the law on such an important issue at such an important time in front of the critical witness or uh, can it be justified that there was such an awkward, ambiguous attempt to correct the misstatement later on toward, toward the, the very end? And, and I think what this illustrates, and I want to get back to the point that, that John just made, is that the federal process should take a very independent look at these facts, not relying on the grand jury determination in the state and local process, because as we've seen, there were many flaws in that process. I'm saying this with the utmost respect to the individual grand jurors, but a lot of concerns about the process itself. So that should not be a process that causes the feds to say, hey, they couldn't meet the state burden 
we can't really seriously consider whether there's enough evidence here to meet the admittedly higher federal burden of showing some intentionality. It's not a burden to show race-based discrimination or a conscious <clears throat> thought about the Constitution, but you do have to show a requisite degree of intentionality in the use of excessive force. And if you take the preponderance of witnesses who saw some kind of gesture of hands being raised, if you take some of Officer Wilson's statements and you examine them with a, through a window that says, what if he was lying? He said there was a hand reaching for the, the waistband on the part of uh, Michael Brown. No other witness seems to have said that. He, Officer Wilson, didn't seem to see the hands being extended up, as a number of other will, uh, witnesses said. So if you piece together not only the, the, the witness te testimony that favors a, a homicide prosecution, but also what uh, a prosecutor might say are false exculpatory, that is to say statements by Officer will, Wilson that inaccurately attempted to portray a picture of innocence, you could add up to a case. It wouldn't be an easy federal case, but it is certainly something that needs to be seriously considered. Kendall Coffey and John Burris, thank you very much for joining yeah, me thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you both. Hey, thank you. Coming up, Ray Rice and his wife, Janae, speak to Matt Lauer about how they're planning to rejoin the NFL family. And drones spotted flying too close to commercial airliners, the FAA is taking action.